بل محمد وعلى محمد سلوات سجاد رہائی پا کر بھی پردیس سے گھر کو آ کر بھی جب عشق بہاتے رہتے تھے زینب سے دکھ دیکھے نہ گئے ایک روز ترپ یہ پوچھا سجاد تو کب تک روئے گا اس وقت میرے مولا نے کہا اس وقت میرے مولا نے کہا اما ہے اپنے مقدر پر سگرا کے سوالوں پر کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد اے میری پھوپی انصاف تو کر نیزے پہ جو دیکھے باپ کا سر ہو ساتھ سفر میں وہ جس نے چیرا تھا علی اکبر کا جگر دروں کی سزا ملتی ہو جہاں بچوں کو عشق بہانے پر کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد تم چھپ چھپ کر خون روتی ہو میں روں تو کیوں کہتی ہو رویا نہ کرو اے لال میرے بھائی کو گوا کر بیٹھی ہو معصوم بہن کو زندہ میں جو چھوڑ کیا تنہا آیا گھر کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد نیزے سے گھرا عباس کا سر میں دیکھ چکا ہوں وہ منظر دربار میں میں کیوں مر نہ گیا جب نام تمہارا لے لے کر کہتا تھا لئی زینب ہے کہاں لے آؤ یہاں پر بے چادر کیوں نہ روئے سجاد کیوں نہ روئے سجاد 
क्यों न रोए सजाद क्यों न रोए सजाद सब कत्ल हुए मैं जिंदा हूँ बेमार सही लर सकता है अरे बीमार सही लर सकता था शर्मिंदा हूँ मैं असगर से वो तीर सितम से रल तो गया वो तीर मेरे क्यों कर न लगा जिस तीर से घायल तास गर क्यों न रोए सजाद 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 क्यों शाम क्यों सामने अस घर के जाऊं अरे क्यों सामने सो गिरा के जाऊं बेहतर तो यही है मर जाऊं तुम जिंदा हो अकबर न रहा वो पूछे तो क्या बतलाऊं क्या सब्र करूं क्या जब्त करूं है जख्म बहुत दिल के अंदर क्यों न रोए सजाद 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 पर हंदवाल मोहम्मद सलावत सलाम अलैकुम वरहमतुल्लाहि व बरकातहू let us pray for a young Mukhi Saab who is unwell at the moment and unable to be with us. For he's got a severe bout of flu and fever. And our other Mukhi Saab is also otherwise engaged. So you have the part-time Mukhi in front of you today. Our condolences on this night of the shahadat of our fourth Imam, Imam Zul Abidin alayhi salam. One of the great tragedies in the history of our 12 Imams for the Musiba that he went. And inshallah, tonight is a night that we will mourn his passing away. And inshallah, Allah will accept our Zadari. Just to remind you all that inshallah, tomorrow evening at uh, 6.45 p.m., there is a madlis held by our brother, Mohsin Zaidi Saab for the Isale Sawab of his parents. He's requested everybody to attend and the majlis will be uh, conducted by Sayyid Abidi, inshallah, in Urdu. Once again, a general reminder that Sunday we have our Jerusalem program. A lot of effort has gone in organizing this particular Jerusalem this year. The volunteers have put in a lot of efforts and as I kept saying that this Jalus is our way of taking the tabligh out from the four walls into the wider world so that people know that what Hussein stood for. Throughout the world we find that who is Hussein, this movement has gathered so much importance and it has bec become one of the success and highlights. 
and alhamdulillah with the Jalus that we are going to partake on Sunday, this is one of the efforts that we go and say, look, you may not understand what this is about, but we are here to part that message of Imam Hussein so that if one or two people, not that we want to convert everybody, but just to say that this Imam sacrificed his life for humanity, for truth, and to reestablish his grandfathers and Allah's religion. And that is what we do here come for the two and a half months in this month. But it is more important that we do take this azadari outside and say that no Imam Hussein, especially this fourth Imam whose wafa we conduct tonight, is actually honored because his journey from Karbala to Kufa to Sham with his aunt was a tremendous, tremendous tabligh in his own self. So let us understand that whatever we may think about the Jalusis that are being held different ways and different places in the world, we have got one message and one message that Kulu Yaman Ashura, Kulu Azim Karbala is not in these four walls, but is actually the Imam Hussein's message of Halmin Nas outside. We as parents, we as members of the Jamaat, we have a responsibility to go out with our youngsters, with our children, so that this movement of Hussein is remembered. So a plea from the behalf of the hard workers of the Jalus Committee, do please come here on Sunday. We'll have Salatul Jama'ah at 1256. If you can't make it, meet us at the station, and we'll go to Christ Church. And once again, I request you, follow the instructions of the volunteers. They have been trained, they've been briefed, and they know how the procession should be conducted with the organizers of the police and the council. With this, I'm going to ask our Sheikh to come and proceed with tonight's Majlis. Wassalamu alaikum. Bar Habib Khuda Khatmul Ambiya Bawaz Buland Salawat. May I please also ask you all to come on this side and let the angels you know, occupy that place over there. Please. With one loud salawat. Allahumma an kara al-Fatiha. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين رحمة للعالمين مولانا وسيدنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرض أرواحنا له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يتق الله يجعل له مخرجا ويرزقه من حيث لا يحتسب ومن يتوكل على الله فهو حسبه إن الله بالغ أمره قد جعل الله لكل شيء قدرا صلوات Respected elders, brother, sister, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, is it the microphone which is strange or is it my voice which is strange? Inshallah, he's working on it, good. May Allah give him tawfiq, inshallah. Tonight's lecture is going to be on the great personality of our fourth Imam, 
an Imam which has had a very turbulent life and a very sad life in the sense that he witnessed the whole event of Karbala and then he had to live with those memories for the rest of his life and throughout his life he would remember those day those days of Karbala and that day of Ashura I want to start off with a few episodes from his life and then we talk about some of the events that took place after Karbala regarding especially the burial of Ahlul Bayt <coughs> So regarding Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu was salam Allahumma salla ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad His blessed birth Sorry His blessed birth took place on 5th of Sha'ban 38 AH and he leaves this world on 25th of Muharram 95 AH His titles tell us a lot He was known as Zainul Abidin, Sayyidul Sajidin, Sajjad All of this points to one very particular way of life of Imam And that was his Ibadat We don't say he was Abid, we say he is Zainul Abidin We say in Urdu Ibadat Guzarun Ki Zinat The beauty or the beautification of those who conduct worship Sajjad is another one of his titles. Sajjad is what we call in Arabic isme mubaligha. It's used to exaggerate certain qualities. So if you say Sajid, it's someone who prostrates. If you say Sajjad, it means someone who prostrates a lot. It, he prostrates so much that he's known by this quality of frequent and long prostrations. You may or may not know this. We have some reports in Riwayat which are tremendous about his sajdas. One report is that when he would do sajda, he would do sajda for so long. For example, when you sit in one position for a long time, what happens? The blood flow gets restricted, right, in the legs. And then you get pins and needles. And then when if you try to stand up, it's difficult because you've lost the feeling and sensation in that part of your body because blood has not flown there. Well, he would do prostration for so long that basically the blood flow would stop to those parts of the body and then when he wanted to stand up, he couldn't stand up. He would have to actually crawl a distance. From sajda to stand is difficult, from sajda to crawl it's easier. He would have to actually crawl a little bit while the blood flows back and then he could stand up. His uh, sajdas were long in that sense, very very long. Was he born in Medina or Kufa? This is a debate amongst historians. It's not clear whether he was actually born in Medina or Kufa. By that time, Ahlul Bayt had all moved to Kufa by the time of his birth. That seems to be the stronger opinion that he was born in Kufa. His parents, of course, his father is the illustrious Sayyid al-Shuhda, Imam Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. His mother was someone called shah zanan shah zanan she was the daughter of the last of the kings of persia in arabic we would say sayyidatun nisa sayyidatun nisa so shah zanan was this daughter from persian origin history says that imam ali salam chose her to marry our third imam However, when they translate the name from Shah Zanan to Sayyidatun Nisa, it doesn't quite work, does it? Because there can only be one Sayyidatun Nisa. That's Janabe Fatima Salamu Allahi Alayha. So, what history suggests is that Imam Ali Islam changed the name of Shah Zanan to Shahar Banu. Shahar Banu was her eventual name. Shahar Banu means. Queen, royalty of female. In any case, this is his illustrious mother. In spirituality, he is unsurpassed. The interesting thing is that after the event of Karbala, because the Bani Umayyah was so much trying to stop Imam Sajjad from propagating what happened in Karbala, they wanted to close his communication off. They kept a lot of vigil on him. A lot of eyes were kept on him. He was very much restricted. 
However, what he did was he did something brilliant. He actually passed us a lot of messages and a lot of information and lessons through his du'as. His du'as are not just manuals of supplication and worship. They're actually messages of Islam. If you look carefully in there, there's a lot of lessons, a lot of akhlaq, a lot of things we can take away from it, such as what? Reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trusting upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Things were difficult upon the Shias. Things were difficult upon the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Imam Sajjad salam provides them with some support and some, some backbone in those days through his du'as. He teaches them not to be forlorn, not to lose hope, to always hope in Allah, to always count the bounties of Allah, to appreciate one another, to appreciate their neighbors, to appreciate the parents, to appreciate everything around them, to keep them steadfast on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when you take all of his different supplications together and we put them all together, there's a book that is formed that is known as Sahifa Sajjadiyya. Sahifa, basically, page or pages. Sajjadiyya. In English, lit loosely, we can translate it as the Psalms of Islam. In other words, the supplications of Islam. This is a collection of du'as of our fourth Imam. Now, very interestingly, the great Allama Tabatabai, Salawat upon his name, please. Allah Very special personality. May Allah raise his station. We owe a lot to Allama Tabatabai. I cannot put it into words, but the amount that we owe this man is unsurpassed. Allama narrates during his lifetime. Allama lived in Iran, and there was a French philosopher who was his contemporary. Who was that? Henry Corbin. Henry Corbin was a French philosopher. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I have to be careful not to say Jeremy Corbin, isn't it? Henry Corbin was a French philosopher and a devout Christian at the same time. To learn more about Islam, he got in touch with Allama. And he said to Allama, I want to come and see you. And not only once, they had multiple meetings. They had different meetings at different times. And Corbin, being a devout, devout Christian, as well as a philosopher, he was an intelligent man. He would go and he would travel to Iran, he would go to Tehran and meet Allama. Allama says that most of the time when we used to meet, Corbin would be the questioner. He would ask questions and I would answer, providing him with information. Most of the times it was like this. And if you look at some of his works, uh, Shia, Shia Dar Islam and Quran Dar Islam, these two works, I think they're in English as well, Quran in Islam and Shia in Islam. Um, they are somehow the products of these discussions between him and Jeremy, Co uh, sorry, Henry Corbin, there you go. They are the products of his discussions with Corbin. In any case, so most of the time Corbin would ask, Allama would answer. However, there was one moment that Allama narrates. He says that on one occasion I asked Corbin, I said, tell me something. There are moments for every believer in God that he would desire to speak to his Lord in a very special way. We pray namaz, it's a conversation with God. We recite Quran, it's a conversation with God. We are reciting the words of God. Kunut is another type of conversation with God. namaz e is a conversation with God. Munajat of the Aima are, are con conversations with God. These conversations are different. Some of them are very touching. Some of them are very short. Some of them are very long. Some of them are very in-depth. Some of them are not so in-depth. Some of them, like Dwaya Arafat of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, can last, can last two to three hours. Some of them are very short. Like in the Quran, we have these one-line ayats which we use as dua. So Allama says to him, there are moments for every believer in God where a person would like to speak with his Lord 
and whisper to him in a very special manner. And not just ask things from him. See, sometimes we misunderstand the role of dua. What we think is, I want something or I need something, therefore I should pray dua. Aima didn't think like this. Aima Tahirin did not think like this. They did not pray dua because they wanted something. They prayed dua because they wanted to converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The things that they asked for were just bahana. They were just excuses to talk to Allah. They were just excuses to talk to Allah. A mu'min really looks at dua and he says, I'm not reciting this because I want something from God. I'm reciting this just because I want to converse with Him. So Allama says, what about when you want to converse with God? Not when you want something, but when you want to talk to Him. Just talk to Him and spill your heart out to Him. Converse with Him. Then what do you do? Because Allama says, because in our religion, we have a series of du'as. But I cannot find those types of du'as in your religion, Christianity. You know what Corbin said? Corbin says, you're right. When I want to talk to my Lord in this way that you're describing, I take a book called Sahifa Sajjadiyya. And I read those du'as in French. And I communicate with my Lord. And I cry. These are monotheistic things. Although they are full of Islamic messages. However, they can resonate with anyone of any religion really in theory. Especially if you are an enlightened person, educated person, philosopher type person like Corbin was. So this was Imam Sajjad. He has this effect of his du'as and his supplications which are cross-culture, cross-religion even. I ask you, we are Shias of Imam Sajjad. How much do we read of Sahifa Sajjadiyya? I wonder, it's a tough question. How much do we read? If other people are picking up this book with a limited amount of ma'rifah maybe, and we are supposed to have more ma'rifah in our hearts, and we are not reading, what a shame. In any case, I want to narrate one more story from the life of this great man with Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad. It is the time of Hajj during the lifetime of our great Imam, Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salatu was salam. During this time, one of the ruling family members, Hisham, he was not actually the Caliph. Sometimes this is narrated that he was the Caliph of the time. Actually, at that moment, he was not. But he was in line for Khilafat. Hisham, still a big personality, big man, you know, comes along to Hajj. And typically these kinds of people, what do they do? They come along and they have a massive entourage with them. They've got what we say in Gujarati, chamchas. They have their chamchas with them, yeah? The people around them to make them feel good. Some are bodyguards. Some are, for example, there to record what's going on. Some are there to praise him and help him along. Some of them were poets. Some of them were poets. In other words, they were there to big up Hisham, to make him feel good, to praise him, to praise him in front of others. So what their job was that whatever happened, they would go along and they would recite poetry. Sometimes about Hisham, sometimes about not Hisham, but whatever, they were there to bring comfort to him. One such poet who came along with him in his entourage was the great poet Farazdaq. Farazdaq Shair. Farazdaq, very interesting personality. Farazdaq is, this, is in this entourage of Hisham. And he comes with him and they go into Masjid al Haram. After doing the tawaf, Hisham wants to go and kiss the black stone. I guess times don't change. Even in those times around the black stone, there was a big rush, hard to reach. So Hisham is thinking, well, I'm one of the ruling family. I'm royalty. People should make way for me. No one cares. In Hajj, no one really cares about this kind of thing. So they ignore him. They don't pay any attention to him. 
He's not given any priority. He's not able to reach the black stone. So what they say is they say, look, let, let's just wait for a moment. Our turn will come. Let's have some sabr. So they're standing on the side. All of a sudden from nowhere in Masjid al-Haram, our Imam enters. Imam enters without saying anything, without saying move, without saying give me space, without rushing along, without pushing anyone. People naturally feel his presence, look at his radiant face, and they just make way for him. Kudrati, they just automatically just make way for him. Now Hisham is standing on the side. He's the ruling family guy. He's got an entourage around him. He's meant to be the top dog. All of a sudden he's seeing Imam coming out of nowhere, not really making any effort, yet people are making way for him. So Hisham says, who is this person? Most likely he knew. Most likely that was said in a derogatory manner. When you don't want to acknowledge someone's greatness, you say these kinds of things. Who is this person? Who does he think he is? I don't know him. And his other chamchas or cronies, I guess they were scared of him, so they started to say, well, we don't know, we don't know. And here, Farazda cannot contain himself. And this is usually the way. Our community, maybe we don't appreciate these things anymore because we've moved away from that way of thinking. So our community may not appreciate this kind of thing. But when you are a poet or when you are an artist or when you have some artistic flair or artistic tendencies, you know, it's very difficult to dabao them, to keep them under wraps. Poetry, once upon a time, was something very much valued in our community, actually. I guess things change. In any case, when a poet has inspiration, or that kind of person, an artistic person, has that kind of inspiration, very difficult to get them to subdue it. So Hisham could not wait. He could not bear this conversation going on, that who is this man? And everyone's saying, oh, I don't know, I don't know who he is. So he starts to speak in Ash'ar. He starts to speak in poetry. He says, you don't know him? Let me introduce him to you. Let me introduce him to you. He says, Hisham, you don't know him? Well, it seems the ground of Makkah knows him very well. It knows his footsteps. Walbaytu ya'rifuhu. The Kaaba knows him. Wal Hillu Wal Haramu, the hill area of Makkah, the Haram area of Makkah, all of these things they know him. Then he goes into other sifat of Imam Zain. We can't do the whole poem, but some some bits inshallah with Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Starts to say some things about Imam Zain al Abidin. These are lovely. But you need to understand the art of poetry to appreciate it. Brothers and sisters, let me say a couple of things, if you don't mind. You know, many times in our nohas and marshyas, we kind of get it wrong. Our nohas and our marshyas are poetry, aren't they? They are poetry, right? Anyone disagree? They are poems. There is such a thing called poetic license. In poetry, you don't expect things to be literal in their meaning. If you do, it's not poetry. Or you've misunderstood poetry. In poetry, things are not taken exactly literally. So many times people say they hear a noha, they hear a marcia. Ah, kya thiutu Karbala ma? Well, this didn't take place in Karbala. Ah, bhai, we know. It didn't happen exactly, literally like this. But this is a poetic expression. These are things said in poetry. They should be taken in their context. Please, if you don't have this ability to understand this context of poetry, you shouldn't really be commentating on it. Poetry has its own way, its honor, its fun, its skill, its way of expression. You have to understand that. So what does Faraz Daq say? Wal Baytu Ya Rifuhu Wal Hillu Wal Haramu 
the Kaaba knows him, the Haram knows him, the hill knows him. Ma qala la qattu. He has never uttered the word no. What is la? What is la in Arabic? It means no. He never says no. In other words, when someone comes to him and asks him for something, he'll never say no. It doesn't mean literally Imam has never said no in his life. It's an expression. Ma qala la qattu illa fi tashahudihi. Except in his tashahud, there he says no. Why? Because tashahud is la ilaha illallah. So in matters of these kinds of things, of course he'll say no. Otherwise he doesn't say no to people. You go to him, you ask him for something, you want something. He can help you somehow. He'll never say no. These are kareem. These are very generous people. These are the very, very most generous people. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ma qala la qattu illa fi tashahudihi lawla tashahud kanat la uhu na'amu And if it was not for tashahud, then even that la would have been na'am. If it was not for that, even that would have been na'am. Na'am means yes. So again, these are exaggerations, these are poetic expressions. Don't get too stressed about it, inshallah. This is the, the, the nature of a poet and an artist. He says these kinds of things. Lawla tashahud kanat la'uhu na'amu. Then this is very beautiful. May Allah give us tawfiq, inshallah. We, I don't know, in our way of life, in our culture, in our minds, in our brains, in our thoughts, does this come in? Will we be able to fathom this or not? I don't know. May Allah give us tawfiq, inshallah. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Prasdak says, in praise of Imam Zainul Abidin, Yughdi hayaan wa yughda min mahabatihi. Yughdi hayaan. He has a level of haya and modesty. His level of haya and modesty makes him not stare at people. I don't know, today... Will anyone understand these things? But in those days, this was regarded as a high merit. Not to stare at people. Not to linger on people's looks. People put their heads down. Now today, in this day and age, maybe we don't understand it. We don't value these things anymore. But these are things in Ahlul Bayt's life. So now we have to ask ourselves a question. Maybe we have slightly misunderstood things. Or maybe we have come away from certain etiquettes that were there. He wouldn't stare at anyone. Yughdi hayaan wa yughda min mahabatihi. He would put his eyes down because of his haya. Dignified, honored person. Wouldn't stare at someone. At the same time, yughda min mahabatihi. Others out of his awe and his azmat would also look at him and their eyes would go down. They could not stare at him either because he had that azmat and that awe, what we say, haybat. He had that haybat, people could not also stare at him. You know the famous um, report about Imam Khomeini, that some journalists report that when we would go to interview him, we couldn't actually meet eye to eye. We would try, but then our heads would invariably go down and we couldn't quite meet eye to eye. This is haybat. This is awe. A-W-E. Awe. فَمَا يُكَلَّمُ إِلَّا حِينَ يَبْتَسِمُ And no one would dare to speak except when Imam smiled. No one would dare to speak except when Imam smiled. Again, Exaggeration, poetic license, poetic expression. What does it mean? It means people had respect for Imam. They would not precede him in speech. They would not treat him as a person that they could just waste his time. They had dignity for him. He had dignity for himself. He had dignity for others. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
This is the son of the best of creation. All of them put together. This is someone who is taqi, pious, naqi, pure, at-tahir, pure, pure, alamu. He is a signpost of our religion. This is the son of Fatima, in case you don't know him. The prophets were sealed by his grandfather. This was Farazdak's poetic expression at that time. Now, what happens? Well, boy, oh boy, Farazdak. He was brought as a chamcho of Bani Umayya. Now he's like a fork in Bani Umayya. Why? Well, he was brought to praise them. And here he is praising the man that they don't like. They don't like him, Imam. They see him as a threat. They see him as a challenger. And here is Farazdak being paid by Bani Umayya, but actually uttering words of poetry in praise of Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salatu was salam. So what happens? Well, first of all, his salary is cut. He doesn't get paid. Number two, he gets sent to prison. Farazdak is imprisoned. They tell him, how dare you do this? You're going in jail. Imam remembers. Imam doesn't forget. Imam remembers this gesture of Farazdak. Imam, it is said in history, sends Farazdak 12,000 dirhams as a gift. Farazdak sent it back. Farazdak says, no, I'm not going to accept. If I wanted money, Bani Umayyah were already paying me. I didn't do this for money. Imam says, no, Imam sends it back. Second time. Imam says, no, I know you didn't do it for money. But this is from me to you. And your ajr will not reduce because of this. Don't worry. It's not like I'm paying you and your ajr will reduce. You are sincere. You will get your reward. Imam sends it back to him. Now, how does one, such as Farazdaq, how does one gain this level of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That whatever happens, I'm not going to allow my beloved Imam, one whom I regard as pure and amazing, to suffer. Bale, I will suffer. I don't mind. But I will not allow my Imam to suffer. Let it be that I lose my job. But my Imam should not be disgraced. Let it be that I am imprisoned. But my Imam should not face any calamity. How does one achieve that level of tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because that's what it is. It is tawakkul. Someone who takes a job which is full of sin or during his work he sins. Is he trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is he having enough trust in Allah? Maybe he thinks my risk comes from someone else. So if I don't do this, I will lose my job. So let me sin for the sake of my risk. Well, he sees his risk in the hands of someone else and not in the hands of God. Isn't it? That's, that's my conclusion. I don't know if you agree with me or not. Someone who sins in the line of work purposefully, intentionally and says, I'm willing to sin against God for the sake of my job. Maybe he doesn't realize that the risk is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't need to sin. Anyway, let me just provide you a little bit of more information on this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Whoever has fear of Allah, whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will find him a way out. وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Allah will provide for him in a way that he never imagined. He had never done hisab, he had never done accounting that my risk could come from this channel. But Allah chooses this amazing new channel to give him his risk. وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ What is this based on? 
there's a big condition. You need, if you want to take advantage of this kind of thing, you have to have tawakkul upon God. Trust in Allah. He is the true provider. Your boss, your company is not the true provider. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not your provider. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He may use different conduits at different times, but He is providing you, not anyone else. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ Whoever has trust in God, God will suffice him. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بَالِغُ عَمْرِ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدْرًا Now, how to build tawakkul, maybe we don't have time for today, but a couple of things regarding tawakkul and how it can shape our lives and actually some of the afat and calamities which come when we don't have tawakkul. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> See, there's one thing that I feel a lot of us we're prey to. And it has a lot of afat in our community. A lot of calamities in our community because of this. We tend to either ourselves or for our children delay marriage because we feel the boy or girl is not yet on their own two feet they're not earning enough they're not at a position marriage may have become wajib upon them as you know there are circumstances in which mar marriage becomes wajib they may be doing haram things by not getting married they may be conducting themselves in a manner which is definitely not befitting a follower of Ahlul Bayt. Why? Well, family says this person is not yet financially able. It happens, right? And we delay. We delay, we delay, we delay. And then when it comes to it, all of a sudden we realize we've delayed too much. Now it's become difficult to get married. Now the circumstances are changed and it becomes difficult. And so many sins have taken place. One of the advices of our esteemed marja of the time, Ayatollah Sistani, Hafadahullah, may Allah grant him a long life, inshallah. You may have seen this on the web. A group of youths go to him and they say, Agha, can you give us some advice? And he gives eight pieces of advice. If I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head, there was eight pieces. The fifth advice is as follows. Look at what he says. He says, my young ones, let me advise you, give due importance to the establishment of a family through marriage and beget offspring, have children without delay. For indeed, this is a source of joy and serenity for human beings. It leads one to work harder, etc, etc. And then he says, and let nobody fear poverty in this matter. For indeed Allah the Glorified has made marriage one of the means of attaining sustenance. Something that a person would never at first glance imagine. So we have got it wrong. We've got it the other way around. What we think is if we get married, or if we get our kids married, it's going to cost a lot. Agha says no. If you get married, your sustenance will flow. We've taken it the other way. If we get married, it's going to cost a lot. How will we afford it? Agha says, don't worry. You get married, your risk will flow. This is one issue. Marriage in the community. Other issues are where some community members are working and how they are working. For example, regarding alcohol. We have very, very strict laws. In fact, some of the strictest laws that I can see are regarding alcohol. Basically, zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. In anything to do with alcohol. Ruling from Agha. A Muslim is not allowed to serve intoxicating drinks to anyone at all. Even to those who believe it may be lawful for them. So even to non-Muslims, who they will drink anyway, but that's not your problem. Some people say, well, if I don't serve them, they're going to drink anyway. 
let them drink. You don't serve them. Your obligation is not to serve them. You don't take part in that. A Muslim is not allowed to serve intoxicating drinks to anyone at all, even to those who believe it is lawful to them. He is not even allowed to wash the dishes or give them to others if that washing and giving is part of the drinking of intoxicants. In other words, even the smallest level of contribution you make towards the consumption of intoxicating drinks is not allowed. Be very mindful. A Muslim is not allowed to hire himself out for selling or serving drinks or for washing dishes for that purpose. Some people present the extreme need justification for this kind of work. It is an unacceptable justification because Almighty Allah says whoever is careful of his duty towards Allah he will make for him a way out and give him sustenance from where he thinks not. We have to be careful brothers and sisters where we work how we work what we do for work our income our roji our risk has to be halal it's not halal we have got a lot of issues what we spend that money on what we buy with that money what we pray with with that money it has some ethical considerations there inshallah allah give us tawfiq and save us from these things salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad Inshallah, if we get a chance, we'll go through some of the other things regarding tawakkul and how to actually gain tawakkul in one's life. It's a very interesting discussion. Some things are ibadi, you do them as an act of worship, like du'as, there are some du'as that we do. And others are not worship related, they are mindset related. The way you think, the way you see things, the way you react to things, that's all mindset. Probably mindset is more effective. The du'as can complement the mindset. But you can't hope that I'm praying a du'a and I'm doing totally the opposite and I should get the effect of the du'a. Du'as are usually there to supplement our efforts. Inshallah we'll discuss at another time. Let us now remember the shahadat of our great Imam. The masaib of Imam Zainul Abideen, Sayyidul Sajideen. You know, many times when I think of the Masaib of our fourth Imam, it reminds me a lot of the Masaib of the third Imam. Imam Zainul Abidin's Masaib has some correlation with the Masaib of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Why? On the day of Ashura, when there's a Zakir reciting Majlis on the day of Ashura, because you have limited time, but there is so much to recite. There are so many things that happened to Aba Abdullah on that day of Ashura that sometimes we don't know what to recite and what to leave out. It's a difficult decision. Imam Sajjad is very similar. Sometimes we become a little bit disturbed that so much has happened to Imam. What do we recite and what do we leave out? Imam was aged 22 in Karbala. <coughs> Imam was in the prime of his youth. You always want to be at the side of your father, isn't it? You always want to be the one whom your father calls upon for help, to answer his call, to be at his side, to be his right hand, to assist him wherever you can. This is an Imam who was there during the death of his father, but could not do anything for him. Imam Zainul Abideen is that one Imam, he is alive at the time of his father's Shahada. He is said, in the, some of the reports it is said, that when the last moments of, of Aba Abdullah arrived, who was watching these last moments? Not Imam Zainul Abideen at that time. It was the sister of Imam Hussein. Janab Zainab was on Tille Zainabiyya, looking down into the valley of Karbala. 
And when the head is removed from the body of Aba Abdullah, Imam Zainul Abidin, it is narrated, he feels an earthquake. He feels the sky has become black. He feels a shaking in the ground. Janab Zainab comes back into the tent of Imam Zainul Abidin. He says, Oh, my aunt, open the doors of the tent for me. Let me see what is happening. And when he looks out, what does he see? He sees a spear is raised, and atop the spear is the head of Aba Abdullah. This was Imam Zainul Abidin in Karbala. However, this is not the end of his story in Karbala. They say that after Ashura, after three nights pass, the tribe of Bani Asad are gathered in Karbala. One narration describes it like this. You know when Imam Hussein arrives in Karbala, he calls the Bani Asad people. And he makes with them a contract. He says, look, I am buying this land from you, but I have a request. When our bodies are strewn on the ground, when our beloved body, when, I, when the bodies of our beloved sons and nephews are scattered in Karbala, I want you to bury us. The Bani Asad was scared. They were fearful. What if a spy of Ibn Ziyad sees us? What if someone sees that we are burying these bodies and reports it back? Then we will not be spared. They say that a conversation takes place. The wives of Bani Asad tell the menfolk of Bani Asad, Do you not remember your promise to Gharib Karbala? Do you not remember your promise to the son of Fatima? You said you would bury him. They were contemplating this when they report that in a distance away we saw a man approaching. Who was this man? As he draws closer, they realize this is Ali ibn al Hussein Zainul Abidin. Imam, where was he meant to be? He was meant to be in Kufa, in the chains in the prison. But through a mu'jiza, Allah granted him the ability to appear in Karbala. Imam arrives in Karbala. He looks at Bani Asad. He sees they are discussing something. He says, what is happening? They say, oh Ali ibn al Hussein, we are now contemplating burying the bodies. Imam says, then what is holding you up? They say that because the heads have all been removed, we don't know whose body is whose. So how do we bury? Imam says, do not worry. Now I am here. I will help you. I will instruct you what to do. Imam says, first of all, Help me to dig the graves. We must dig three graves. They say, Imam, tell us who is to go in which grave. He says, first you dig the graves. The graves are dug. Three graves are dug. Imam says, in one, you are to place all of the ashab of the shuhada of my father. Place all of the ashab in one grave. This is known as Ganji shuhada. In the second grave, I will bury Three personalities, my father is there, my two brothers are there, they will be buried in the second grave. They say, Imam, for whom is the third grave? He says, that is for someone very special, my father's friend Habib. He is to have a separate grave. He was very dear to my father. Habib is given a separate grave. When they go towards the body of Aba Abdullah, Imam says, no, you are not to lift it. He is the one person that I only I can bury. When he goes near the body, as a daran of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when he goes near the body of Aba Abdullah, they see him bending down and picking up certain things from the floor. They say, Imam, what are you picking up? He says, look here, there is a finger of my father. Look here, there is another part of the body of my father. He begins to pick up these different parts of the body of Aba Abdullah and he puts them all together and he buries the body. After this burial, he starts to walk. Where does he walk? Imam Zainul Abidin says, now I go towards Furat. They say, Imam, why Furat? He says, there is still one body near to Furat and I will bury this body. When he goes over there, he finds the body. They say that when he lifts this body, one moment he tries to lift it from the right side, the left side of the body falls down. When he tries to lift from the left side, the right side of the body 
he falls down, he looks at the sky and he cries out, Ya Kamar Bani Hashim, Ya Bal Fadl Abbas. This was the burial of the Shuhada of Karbala that our beloved Imam undertook. However, Azadaro, no matter what we say about Karbala, let us ask Imam Zainul Abidin himself. When people would ask him, O oh, Ali ibn al Hussein, tell us which was the most difficult part? Was it Karbala? Was it Kufa? He would say, No. He would say, Asham, Asham, Asham. When we walked into Sham, that was the most difficult part. There's one narration that I want to recite, and this is the final part of the Masaib. This narration is when Imam Zain al Abidin enters into Sham. One of the companions of Rasulullah, his name was Sahal, Sahal bin Sa'ad. He was a very dignified companion of the Holy Prophet. He says, when this kafala came into Damascus, into Sham, and people were celebrating, and people were screaming, and people were celebrating like it was Eid. I had to ask someone, is this day the day of Eid? They said, no, this is not the day of Eid. Look at whom they have brought. And when I looked closely, I noticed that this was Ali ibn al Hussein. And I went to him, and I saluted him, and I told him, I am Sahal. I was the companion of your grandfather, Rasulullah. He says, oh Sahal, can can you do me a favor? He says, Mawla, anything. He says, Sahal, go and buy a piece of cloth and bring it for me. Sahal says, I went and I bought a piece of cloth. I thought Ali ibn al Hussein wanted to cover himself with this cloth. Instead, when I handed him the cloth, he, he bunched it up and he put the cloth under the chain that was around his neck because he said, Oh Sahal, this chain has been eating it into the skin of my neck since we have left Karbala with this cloth I will put some comfort on my neck Matam e Hussein Azadaro ke abid dafn hote hain kar karo yaro ke abid dafn Chali hai khult se zahra hai hure peetti hamra Madine mein hai gul yaro ke abid da naho Cause 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Mominin, you must have read our email communication in that that on Saturday, next Saturday, 13th of October, we need your assistance, we need your help, and especially those who are those who have the ability to be uh, electronic um, aware, because we are going to rectify the uh, sound system and clear all the outstanding bits and pieces and we need your help. So the whole day on Saturday, inshallah, those who are able to come, do please come and assist the AV team. There are people coming from Stanmore, inshallah, and we need to make sure that all the cabling, all the wires, all the outstanding work is done as much as possible. So if you can spare a few hours and you are quite able to uh, even learn or take instructions from those people who are gonna be here, we want, we want all the youngsters, all the youths, we want the uh, people who are in the electronic um, uh, field to come and assist. This is important, this is our Imam Barga. We have got a wonderful system, it does need tweaking, it does need setting up, inshallah, and we look forward to your full participation. So you please come and see uh, Imtiaz Bai uh, in the AV room, or any of uh, EC team, or send an email directly to the Secretariat to say that, inshallah, you'll be here. Secondly, I just want to reiterate for those people who perhaps came a bit late, that, and I spent about three, four minutes on explaining the importance of the Julus. Those who have came a bit late, please, can you make a point? If not for your sake, for the sake of your children, to understand that this Julus is our tablir that goes out from the four walls and is actually a direct plea of Imam when he said that take my message out. We are born in, in this wonderful religion, but our duties doesn't just stop here in the four walls or in the grounds, it has to go out. The team, Julus team has spent a lot of time, months in fact, to make sure that this Julus is taken out. Your support, your attendance, inshallah, this Sunday, either here at 12.56 for Salatul uh, Jama or at two o'clock at uh, the railway station, Central Milton Keynes, please will be much appreciated. May I please invite you all to stand up for the ziara. <laughs> Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Assalamu alayka ya Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya Habib Allah. Assalamu alayka ya Amir al Mu'minin wa Sayyid al Wasiyin. Assalamu alayka ya Siddiq al Tahira. Fatima al Zahra. Sayyid al Nisai al Alamin. السلام عليك يا خديجة الكبرى أم المؤمنين السلام عليك يا أبا محمد الحسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا أبا محمد أبا عبد الله الحسين مذنوم شهيد بكربلاء ورحمة الله وبركاته قص زيارة هذا الإمام سيدنا العابدين عليه السلام كربة من الله تعالى السلام عليك يا سيد الساجدين السلام عليك يا خليفة الحسرات السلام عليك يا صاحب العبرات السلام عليك يا أسير الكربات السلام عليك يا آدم آل العباء السلام عليك يا ابن خامس أهل الكساء السلام عليك يا ابن سيد الشهداء السلام عليك يا إمام الإمام دل أتقيا السلام عليك ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا مولى بعبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك وناخت برحلك عليك مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأهل مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين 
الحسين هو على علي بن الحسين هو على أولاد الحسين هو على أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاي يا أبو الفضل العباس وأختيك زينب وأم كلثوم وبنتك سكينة جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا مولا يا غريب الغرباء السلطان ابا الحسن مولانا علي بن موسى الرضا كن شفيئنا وشفيء والدينا في يوم الجزاء وفقنا الله لزيارتك يا مولا ورزقنا الله شفاعتك في الدنيا والاخره والصلاة والسلام على آبائك الطاهرين وابنائك المعسومين وعلى أختك فاطمة المعسومة جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا مولا يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمن السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا كعبة الإيمان السلام عليك يا إمام الإنس والجان عجل الله لك ما وعدك من الناس وظهور الأمر ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك حجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتيه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الفاتحة مع الصلوات